and and we are having success in shifting that mindset um, by starting with these economic impact figures that Lee started to refer to. Um, in in particular, you know, don't don't lose don't don't lose that little uh, factoid that Lee dropped into her introductory remark, remarks about how prominent outdoor recreation is across the landscape of the Alaskan economy. Um, she mentioned that it's over 4% 4, 4 of GDP um, for Alaska. Now there are other large sectors in Alaska uh, and um, you know they're doing the same thing. They're highlighting their impact. 4% um, is, is really quite extraordinary. The national average is in, in, the, in the range of 2%. So you know, state by state by state, Alaska is at least twice as reliant on outdoor recreation for its economic lifeblood as uh, the rest of the lower 48. And so uh, it's, a, it's an economic gem for you, uh, but it may be an underappreciated economic gem. Uh, and I think that's, that's what we collectively might be here to, uh, to work on, on rectifying. Um, we're making progress. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about some of the progress we've made. Uh, but then, you know, in, in my pre-call with Lee, we also thought it'd be helpful uh, to bring it back home to Alaska to talk about some of the challenges. Um, in, in terms of progress, and um, if, if some of you have been watching this space, this may feel a little bit redundant, but I'm going to assume that um, at least a good number of you have not been watching uh, this space all that closely over the course of time. Um, this space being the, the rec economy movement. I'm going to talk about some, some successes that we've had across the nation just in the last four, five, six years. So um, one of the big successes uh, we helped facilitate um, in the 2018-2019 uh, timeframe, uh, and, and that was to develop what I might considered to be sort of the Bill of Rights or the Constitution of the Outdoors. Uh, it's actually called the Confluence of Confluence Accords. And uh, you can go to confluenceofstates.org or .com, I can't recall which, but uh, you you'll find this document, this document that states sort of the fundamental benefits and, and values of time outdoors. And what's important to know is that those benefits are yes, economic, but they also drive other societal uh, goods, if you will. And in other sessions, I think you hit on some of those other benefits. So basically the Confluence Accords acknowledge that outdoor recreation is good for your economy, that outdoor, outdoor recreation is, is good for the development of your, of your youth and of your workforce. Even if, if your youth and your workforce don't go into outdoor recreation as a business, there are employers and there are young people who, who thrive, who do better when they incorporate time outdoors into their life. You know, people move their businesses or they move themselves to Alaska to enjoy the outdoors, it, just to, to capture it in one way. So the outdoors is good for the economy. It's good for, for your communities. Um, there's health and wellness benefits that you talked about. Um, and then, you know, obviously none of this works unless you also have a strong stewardship and conservation ethos. And so these benefits are, are, are wrapped up in this document, the Confluence Accords. And to date, 13 states have signed on to the Confluence Accords, and they are red states, blue states, and purple states. And so you know, this bipartisan group of, of, of states, the revolutionary, if you will, because there are 13 of them, uh, have all agreed that outdoors has these, 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 uh, these range of benefits and it's government's jobs to accentuate those benefits. Um, if I go a little bit further, um, you know, those are 13 states have, that have signed the document. At this point, 17 states have have created offices of outdoor recreation. Uh, these are people tasked by their governors to work cross agency in order to maximize those different benefits of time outdoors. So for example, in Washington state, we have one of the earlier offices and John Schneider's job is to work 
with the Department of Natural Resources, but also with the Education Department and also with the Business Development Department and see how outdoor recreation can be uh, optimized across multiple uh, agencies and you get more bang for your taxpayer buck uh, when educators, when healthcare officials, when economic development officials all look at a, uh, at a park as an asset for them. And so uh, 17 states have these offices uh, that are in optimization mode. Uh, and then uh, even more broadly, the National Governors Association has created a learning network uh, for additional states to come on, come on board and, and sort of catch, catch the movement, if you will, uh, and 25 states are part of the National Governors Association Learning Network on Outdoor Recreation. Alaska is in that group. And so, like, just over the course of the last, you know, like I say, four, five, six years, we've gotten to the point where half of the states in the country are in a conversation at the National Governors Association talking about the importance, the multiple benefits and the importance of outdoor recreation. So it's, it's really, it's quite phenomenal to see and so I, 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 I welcome, Lee knows this, I, I welcome you all into the movement and to the extent Alaska just can continue to lean into it. You know, uh, it's, it's great uh, work, it's very gratifying and I think there'll be tremendous long-term success. Um, part of the success of, of, of accentuating these benefits of time outdoors, we're actually already seeing in Washington, D.C. Um, you know, we're about to close um, uh, off on a, a Congress, two years of, of work in a Congress. And, and your Senator Lisa Murkowski has been uh, uh, quite a champion in, in this regard. Yes, there are, there are really gnarly, challenging, often upsetting um, environmental issues in play in Washington, D.C. and that have cascading effects across the entire country. I don't want to diminish that in the least. But if, but if you look at sort of outdoor recreation as an activity, there have been some tremendous, tremendous victories just in these last two years. Um, the, the US government issued a, its own economic impact report uh, and provide some of that data that Lee cited. So the US government is now reporting on the size of the outdoor recreation economy. Um, the Trump administration's Department of Agriculture offered um, strategic assistance to states uh, and localities that wanted to use outdoor recreation as a tool for economic development. And that offer of technical support, um, economic development support, that was oversubscribed. More states sought help from, from the Ag Department than the Ag Department was able to provide help. Um, so the, so um, you know, there's administrative support in that regard for recreation. Um, and you all will know that two major pieces of legislation have passed, uh, one in 19 and one just over the summer. Um, the, the, you know, the first, the, the Dingle Bill uh, in March of last year, you know, includes hundreds of pages of, of protection for wild places, but also permanently reauthorized the Land and Water Conservation Fund and then just this past summer, uh, Congress fully funded the Land and Water Conservation Fund in perpetuity and put $10 billion against addressing the National Park backlog. And so, you know, it, those are like extraordinary successes. And, and I would say that, you know, they would not have been possible, but for the fact that our community is starting to rise up, if you will, and talk about the multi-benefits of time outdoors, the health benefits, the economic benefits, the community development benefits. And so uh, we've got momentum. Um, one more piece of legislation, just to sort of maybe, uh, you know, top off the conversation and then pivot towards Alaska. Uh, we expect before the end of the year and maybe before the end of November, Congress to pass a piece of legislation that focuses on the healing power of the outdoors, in particular, the healing power of the outdoors for our vets. Um, it's called the Accelerating Veterans Recovery Outdoors Act. And uh, the Senate could adopt it as soon as uh, mid-November and pass it over to the president. 
it would force the Veterans Administration to work more closely with national land managers on how to use our public lands for, for, for vets healing. So, you know, we're, we've got this uh, momentum uh, and I, I, I hope that we can be, create even bigger community about stoking that momentum. Um, I also appreciate that in, in Alaska, um, that can be challenging because of, of some of these matching requirements, in particular matching requirements relative to, and other funding requirements uh, relative to LWCF. Um, you know, it's not just Alaska that's trying to figure out how to make the match. Um, these dollars are starting to flow uh, because we're in a new federal fiscal year. Uh, so I'm not, I don't mean to paint too rosy a picture. There are challenges, uh, but I, I hope that if we uh, stay on message and stay locked arms that uh, with some uh, creativity and some, um, you know, persistence will find way, way through the challenges. So that's sort of like, I guess the, the national perspective from a guy who sits in the Seattle suburbs and tries to have a, a, a view of what's happening in different states around the country as well as DC. Um, Lee, did you wanna kick off a bit of a, a back and forth or? Well, yeah, I, I think, you know, we talked about that um, um, in, in her welcome address to Confluence on Tuesday, um, Senator Murkowski uh, threw down a gauntlet to all of us on this call and our stakeholders across the, the state to collectively focus on figuring out how to ensure our state government is able to provide the necessary matching dollars required to benefit from this increased funding um, that's heading to Alaska thanks to you know, um, Congress approving full permanent funding for Land and Water Conservation Fund. But here in this state, it's not just LWCF funds that are at stake. Um, Transportation Act and Recreational Trails Project and Pittman-Robertson Wildlife Restoration Funds have also proven proved problematic. And um, low priorities <clears throat> for state match and we've reverted funds. Um, so <clears throat> what suggestions do you have for avenues, <clears throat> sorry, that we might explore as we seek to partner with the state to come up with sustainable, politically palatable solutions to improve investments in outdoor recreation. I think you had talked when we were um, prepping for this conference um, about education and healthcare and, and other areas where we might leverage dollars to be able to uh, come up with those matching funds. Yeah, um, so th this, is a, this is a bit of a, uh, vision, if you will, as opposed to a uh, hardcore prescription. But again, I think if we get creative, we may take visions and, and turn them into reality. Um, look, one of the reasons why the outdoors, I, I strongly feel, is, is um, suffering from disinvestment is that government over the course of our lifetimes, over the course of you know the last two, three, four, uh, five decades, government has uh, quote unquote, had to pay for more and more health care and had to keep up with rising costs of education um, and other not other essentials like public safety and, and national security. You know, to the extent that those sectors continue to grow uh, at, you know, rates above inflation and sometimes well above inflation, they squeeze out the ability of government to do other things like support our public lands. So like some people would refer to that as a death spiral. You know, if other sectors are absorbing more of the tax base um, and in the process squeezing out support for public lands, unless you change that fundamental dynamic, the the fund the the funding for public lands and for recreation infrastructure, it's a it's eventually going to peter out. And so you know, one of the reasons why it's important to look at the health and education values of time outdoors is it starts you to think, well, shit, you know, shouldn't those beneficiaries of taxpayer dollars think about the benefits of outdoors to them and their constituents? So, for example, in the health sector, if you're a hospital, and this is basically every hospital, if you're a hospital, you have an affirmative obligation to spend money on preventative community uh, act, 
preventative care in your community. If you take federal dollars to support providing health services and make your money off the federal government, the government says, you know what? You ought to be doing something in your community to reduce healthcare costs. You ought to be doing something at the front end. And so these, these community support obligations are out there and some hospital systems, you know, they they work on smoking cessation. They work on, you know, prevention of STDs, awareness of STDs and, and costs associated there. But, you know, the, the research is showing that time outdoors is healing. And you all talked to my friend Stacy Bear the other day, and, you know, he's walking evidence of the fact that time outdoors can, can lead to fewer costs in provision of pills, if you will, to keep people healthy. And so, you know, to the extent uh, the outdoors is medicine, you know, we should be looking at the healthcare system to invest in that preventative, preventative treatment, if you will. Um, I'm a strong believer, and I think in Alaska, people are strong believers that people, youth develop more coping skills, more team building skills, more problem solving skills when they spend time outdoors. You know, the outdoors is a classroom. You know, to what extent can we get creative and, and talk about how, you know, some of your STEM obligations, to, your obligations to teach STEM uh, could be met by uh, spending time with instructors, you know, touching real outdoor, um, you know, uh, science problems as opposed to doing them in the abstract on a, on a chalkboard. And, you know, you know, funding for education is a gnarly, gnarly place, but I wonder whether long-term there's ways to double up funding, if you will, in support of education and the outdoors. Anyway, those are some ideas. Um, you know, uh, there are probably some that are more near-term and practical, but I think long-term we have to get at this dynamic uh, that challenges funding for public lands big time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to um, go to a question that our friend Chris Beck asked um, uh, in the chat. And he said that, um, you know, Alaska has struggled to do what seems um, so common sense um, elsewhere in the world or our country. And, and that is to get the business community and chambers of commerce uh, to become strong outdoor, uh, uh, strong advocates for outdoor recreation economy. Here, um, you know, when we submitted that Job Stimulus Act was the first time we really got some of our economic development um, uh, agencies and uh, louder voices in business to, um, to glom on, you know, because we were in a pandemic and jobs were, just, we were just bleeding jobs. But on a day-to-day -day basis, what have you seen uh, in other states? How have um, organizations like AOA uh, been able to get messaging through to um, business sector and, and chambers of commerce to really get behind an investment in outdoor recreation economy? So, um, you know, when it comes to the, the, the business voice, um, you know, I would, I would say just follow the money. Um, and, you know, there are places like Alaska, with Lee, you've been a champion. So you're the one who runs the Chamber of Commerce of the Outdoors for the state of Alaska. You know, and around the country, there's probably, you know, another eight, nine, 10 people like you. And without you, you know, the movement in individual states would be like nowhere. So hats off to you for your, for your passion and for your leadership. Um, in terms of following the money, you know, different states have, have, have come upon different ways to, to, to capture that idea. So for example, in, Wa in Wisconsin, most recently uh, they created an office of outdoor recreation and they put that office in the tourism bureau. And they put that office in, in the tourism bureau because Wa Wisconsin sits there in the Midwest and they're like, hey, we got great rivers, we got great lakes, we got great forests. We ought to be able to attract more tourism from outside the state. And by the way, you know, it's it would be helpful to our rural towns in Wisconsin if within the state people spent more time, you know, uh, vacationing in Wisconsin rather than going up to Minnesota. You know, let's keep our home market home. And so, you know, they they've sort of latched on to that stream of money, if you will. Um, 
you know, in, in Utah, they're, they've got the ski resorts and all, um, but, you know, they've really latched on to the fact that since they have the ski resorts, they've also got this, this maker, this maker community. There's all sorts of uh, entrepreneurial uh, startup businesses um, um, and, and longer term businesses, Petzl, um, Cool, um, uh, you know, those are some brands that are, are, are Utah based. And so that's where they're leaning in. And I, I guess I would, I, I don't want to be presumptuous about Alaska. I've been to Alaska, you know, several times. Um, I can't say that I know your economy through and through. You guys do. But, but what's your secret sauce? And, and for, for me, just based on the handful of times I've been there, it's like adventure travel. Like everybody in the United States in the lower 48, you know, if they can afford it, should want to do adventure travel in Alaska. Um, you know, it's the, the last great place, you know, where you don't need a passport in order to do adventure travel. And, it, and you know, I'll separate myself a little bit from, you know, the cruise line industry, which, you know, takes advantage of the Seattle to uh, Alaska route. Um, you know, adventure travel is different than being on a cruise ship. So I don't know if you've, you've actually captured that. Maybe you have, but, um, you know, uh, I'm a big fan of the adventure travel industry. That's what I like to do with my family when we travel. Anyway, that's just one idea of like how you crystallize this idea that you've got economic lifeblood and it's not fully optimized for your for your economic well-being. Right. Well, um, I think that gives us a lot to chew on for sure. Um, and we have um, the next part of our morning here. I hope you can stay for some of these. Um, are some of these um, state level ideas that I think will demonstrate to all of us um, where we might focus our energies. Um, and so uh, they take on two basic themes. We've got two folks that will be talking about winter recreation, which is sort of our unsung season or um, Fairbanks uh, tourism likes to call it the opportunity season. Um, and then we have um, uh, two presentations uh, that really talk about overall investing and what are those um, kind of higher level views of, um, of overall state investment in the sector. So I'm going to start out um, hyper-local, I guess, first. Um, and uh, that would, and, and, and by the way, to everybody tuning in, at the end of this, we'll have a chance to all talk about these ideas and, and maybe come out with some priority um, uh, priorities for how we want to uh, approach those in the coming years and next year in particular. But anyway, um, without further um, ado, I'm going to introduce uh, somebody who have had the pleasure with uh, we've uh, who's led this uh, ignited the the, the uh, local movement to um, uh, address a problem where um, our state budget concerns last year ended up having the Department of Transportation shut down a key maintenance facility that keeps turning in pass open, which is a major recreation area in the Chugach National Forest that's like just minutes drive from um, Anchorage. Um, and, uh, and so we had a, a little conversation at a lunch and learn about three weeks ago and it took about a, a week for Nick Delizio and um, Andy Motoro and, and Nick from Alaska Mining and Diving to get 1600 people and over 160 businesses um, to get behind this idea of, that I'll let Nick go into, I don't wanna steal his thunder, but um, anyway, uh, I, I'm just gonna turn it over to Nick and you can further explain um, what's going on with the Turning and Pass Plowing Initiative. And Nick, by the way, is um, the owner of the Alaska Guide Collective. He's a professional guide and also has another um, enterprise called Remarkable Adventures. So that's your adventure. Uh, tourism guide, um, Mark, when you come up for some winter adventures in Alaska. All right. Well, yeah, thanks, Lee. And uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Got my coffee buzz going, so I think I'm good to go. Um, so like Mark was talking about, I'd like to start by recognizing that the outdoor recreation industry has a lot to be grateful for these days. 
Um, you know, having the Great American Outdoor Act is one example of a positive achievement, and it shows that our government is recognizing how much value our industry has for people and what it brings to our economy. Uh, more than the value of the economy, you know, our industry changes people's lives for the better. I'm lucky to hear the words many times throughout uh, the year from clients. That was the best day of my life. So now to speak on some issues. Um, yeah, last month I appeared on the Lunch and Learn meeting as a panelist. Uh, we ran out of time on that last question, which was, what would you like to see for winter recreation um, in the next 10 years? And I'm thinking 10 years from now, well, climate change is an absolute threat to winter recreation here in Alaska. You know, in 10 years, we will likely not have much of a winter recreation economy. We'll, we'll uh, have to be a different, you know, not very wintry. Um, it's concerning that I will likely not be able to make my living as a backcountry ski guide based here in Girdwood at sea level. You know, beyond science, we have stories. And Alaska is ground zero in the United States for the climate crisis. I would like to see the state of the Alaska government step up to the plate and lead as an example for Washington, D.C. And I mean action now. But today what I'm here for is to discuss an issue that is present for us this winter, uh, a real issue that will be among us any day now. If you're not aware, the state DOT flying budget was cut again this year on top of last year's huge budget cuts, which closed down the silver tip maintenance station and cut five employees. Uh, last year, we had very real safety problems with parking lots not being plowed and the highway was completely shut down two times. Uh, this winter, we are moving into a projected disaster with the huge boom of outdoor recreation happening on public lands. Since the pandemic started, outdoor recreation has blown up along with less people carpooling. So it's like a triple whammy for trailhead parking. Um, so starting in September of 2019, I had been in touch with the Alaska DOT and the Chugach National Forest. And then again this year in early September. Um, and now, you know, as Lee was talking about, uh, for the last month or so, I've been working with the solid team on the Seward Highway Turning and Plow Pass Plowing Initiative. And yeah, big thanks to Lee and Andy Motoro. You know, the guidance they've provided for this has been gold. Um, so why am I doing this? Well, because I care about our greater community safety, um, transportation, and allowing our economy to move forward. And also because most of my days of work are in the Turgon Pass area. So parking there is like me showing up to an office in town to work, but I can't park or barely park, which has become very dangerous too many times. Turgon Pass is home to some of the best backcountry skiing and snow machining in the world. It's absolutely incredible. Um, you know, and I find it embarrassing to have paying clients show up for their dream Alaska ski trip and they see our state's flying struggle. Further, many days I cannot go to where I want to go for certain terrain that is suitable for my client's skill level or the current avalanche conditions. It really hinders my decision-making options for risk management. So while we would all love to see the entire state's winter maintenance budget restored, specifically, I believe the Turingen Pass corridor has witnessed the biggest impacts from budget cuts. Turingen Pass sees the combination of the highest amounts of traffic with the most amount of snow of any road in the entire state. The plowing of the highway and pullouts for parking has really declined over the last few years. However, last year, uh, last winter, it was unacceptable. I would encourage everybody to read the letter that people are signing. This issue goes much deeper than skiers and snow machiners trying to park in the turn and pass area. Beyond individuals and businesses signing, I'm also asking for anybody who can continue to stretch the web of communication we have going with our state lawmakers. Um, there has been some great momentum and networking so far. You know, live news, news coverage and a news article published. Um, the Anchorage Assembly passed a resolution on Tuesday, unanimously 10 to zero in support of this. 
If the state does not come through with a solution, I believe we will have a disaster with very real negative effects to public health and safety, public land access and economical losses. And of all times in the world, uh, this is not the year to limit business productivity. So the letter was sent last Friday to Governor Dunleavy and several other head state officials on behalf of 1,630 individual signers from 55 different communities and representing 151 different businesses. We reached that all within under two weeks. Um, you know, I think that speaks with confidence that people understand the issue and we need a resolution. Um, funding for Turning a pass area needs to be restored. Um, I have yet to receive a response from the governor, but according to the news article, it stated he did receive it. Uh, the letter is open for more signers as we speak, um, as we plan to follow up at a later time to ensure the fiscal year 2022 and beyond has a plan for plowing. Um, so please share this initiative and let's grow that number. This morning I checked at it and it was up to uh, about 1,800 now, and uh, let's blow it up. So I'm gonna screen share here, just a few minutes here. I've never done this, so hopefully it works. You should be, um, you should yeah. be good to go now, yeah. Okay, you guys see that, Some photos? Sweet, it works. So um, photo one here, and I'm just throwing these photos up for anyone who hasn't like, physically witness the mayhem themselves. Um, here's some photos. You know, this is from a news article clipping uh, on February 20th when the Seward Highway was completely shut down um, in a storm. And yeah, I mean, you know, highway closed, traffic backed up in a storm, uh, emergency vehicles could not get through, you know, dangerous. Um, a halt to transportation of oil, goods and services, you know, money flowing is what that means, the economy driving. And businesses like mine and many others cannot operate and get paid that day. So photo two here is from an avalanche advisory two winters ago. Um, and this right here to the right of that truck is the entrance to the main snow machine parking lot where you have a solid six foot snow bank blocking the parking lot, uh, absolutely nowhere to park. Here we go. That this kind of shows the entrance to the. Um, I don't know if you can see my my mouse here, but that's the entrance to the parking lot, and you know, pretty poor quality. Same here. Here's the other side of the entrance, and I mean, trucks get in a lot of days, but it's 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 pretty bad. Um, here's you know a photo of the motorized parking lot. Um, where there's kind of barely a pass through here. I don't really know how that bus got in or out. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's and, and I think really like this photo does not really show how much of a junk show it is out there in the Dragon Pass area. Um, here's an aerial view of the motorized lot. You know, they've got one lane cleared through here. Um, and then specifically take a look at like the entrances and exits here. I mean, you're really blind um, corners right there to get in and out. And keep in mind that this highway has a speed limit of 65 miles an hour. So that basically means, you know, people are doing at least 70 through there on snow and ice. Um, the parking lot is normally, you know, this entire thing all cleared so you can stack in a lot of cars and trucks and trailers. Um, on the non-motorized side here is the, one of the most common parking lots uh, for skiers. And, you know, those of you know where the actual guardrail is, it's, it's way back over here by many, many feet. And so what that does is force the cars closer to the white line here. Um, and just in general, way less ability to park cars. And so what that means is we have cars that are along the side of the highway. The white line is probably right near 
you know, these, these cars here, right here. Um, and that's kind of a common scene more and more. And keep in mind again, like right here, we have a corner and um, there is a 65 mile an hour speed limit where we've got cars doing at least 70. And um, yeah, it's pretty bad. There's been several collisions right in this area that I believe would be preventable if the plowing budget was restored. And finally, I'll just leave you with this photo. Um, you know, again, I want to be really clear that this whole issue and this initiative is not just about skiers and snow machineers trying to park. Um, this is very much about the greater good of, you know, the entire community, all of the, uh, you know, regular commuters that go down to the Kenai or back and forth. Um, it's really changed for them as well. And, you know, I mean, this is the highway where we have a snowbank in the middle of the highway. And so if someone wants to like pull over to uh, take a break or has a mechanical issue with their car, you know, truckers have a serious issue where they literally have nowhere to pull over if they have a mechanical issue. Um, so there we go. Uh, that's what I'd like to share with you all today. Um, I'm gonna go back. Okay, I'll stop. There you go. And I was thinking, um, if I link onto the chat here, the link for the That'd be great. form, everyone, there we go. That's up. If everyone can see that, you can click right there. That brings you the letter and the ability to sign on. So yeah, I'd really appreciate sharing that with as many people as possible. And let's blow this number up and, and make something happen. Cause it's, as you can see, it's a, it's a big issue. And I'm, I'm really worried about for myself, like how am I going to make my living literally? this winter yeah well and i think um that's what i like emphasize uh, that's what um uh i think uh resonates with our elected leaders is this impact on jobs this is not a time to be cutting back on services and risking putting more people on the unemployment rolls so um you've been just awesome um diving into advocacy land and uh getting things done so it's been just fantastic partnering with you nick and Let's hope the governor um, gets back to us and, and lets us know that he's gonna do the right thing. Um, so another uh, aspect of winter, you know, especially here in Alaska, everybody's got at least one or two snow machines, it seems like. Um, and uh, many of those, uh, there's a lot of clubs in Alaska that maintain trail systems uh, that help people get to their cabins and, and, um, and just go out and recreate. And they are a winter network, like, like our road system, but it's our winter network and it's largely maintained through love and passion and a couple dollars here and there um, from a program that my friend Michelle Stevens is going to explain to you. But, you know, again, putting it in that economic perspective, you know, on any, any winter weekend, um, I think you can, like for me personally, when I you know, go down the Glen Highway or the Richardson and count in the winter and count all the trucks and RVs towing trailers and snow machines, then you factor in all the clothing and safety gear, gas and food, then you can understand that Alaska's snow machine industry is another unsung hero of the state's winter recreation economy. So um, I'll introduce you to um, some ideas that my friend Michelle Stevens has about how to get um, the snow track program back on track. And Michelle is the founder of the Petersville Nonprofit Community Corporation and a strong, consistent voice for snow machiners around the state. She's joined me in Juneau a couple of times and is relentless in talking to um, our legislators about the need for um, better support for uh, snow machine efforts in this state. So Michelle, um, I will turn the floor over to you. Hi, Lee. Um, I wanted to say that was some very good information provided by Nick at, about the Turnigan Pass Plowing Initiative. Uh, I know a lot of snow machiners that like to ride there and I shared your uh, letter, Nick, to the AK uh, Snow Shredders on Facebook and on mine. So that I got a lot of people sharing that. So hello, my name is Michelle Stevens and I'm president of Petersville Community Nonprofit at Petersville, Alaska near South Denali. I would like to talk to you about the snow track program, but first I would like to give you a little bit of history. 
The Snowmobile Trails Advisory Council, known as Snowtrack, was established under Title 41 in 1997 through the offices of the Division of Parks and Outdoor Recreation with the mission to fairly represent all Alaskans by advising the Division of Parks on snowmobile issues, including funding, safety, registration, education, access, trail grooming, marking, development, and maintenance. The snow track program was intended to support the local communities in the winter economy. Alaska statues authorized this, the Division of Motor Vehicles to collect snowmobile and off-highway vehicle registration fees. The statute does not state what the fees will go towards. However, since inception, the promise and understanding was that DMV would transfer all fees generated to the Division of Parks and Outdoor Recreation. The intent was once the funds were received, the DMV Division of Parks would establish a state snowmobile advisory board for snow track and that the funds received from DMV would be distributed to clubs and nonprofits that apply for the grant for trail grooming, as well as snowmobile education and safety projects. I would like to clarify the snow track program is funded through a self imposer user tax or snowmobile registration fee. The program is self sustaining due to the reoccurring registration fees collected from DMV and the point of sale registration fees collected by snow machine dealers at the time of purchase and re-registering your snow machine. It is a revenue neutral program that users asked for and fund out of their own registration dollars. 12% of the funds cover the cost of state park employees administering the program and administrative cost. At the time, the snow track program was put into place, snow machiners were proliferating for recreation, transportation, and subsistence use. There were very few marked trails or maintained trails. The consequences were high accident rate, lost snow machiners, which is a cost to the state of Alaska, winter conflicts among trail users and conflicts with private property owners. The snow track program has been a success. It took many years of brushing and cutting trails, surveying and mapping out trails. The communities have, who have received snow track funding have succeeded in achieving all goals the snow track program intended it to be. People are getting to their remote cabin safe. They are buying and hauling fuel and supplies. More land is being purchased and cabins are being built because of the ease of, and safety of, trail, of the trail systems being marked and groomed. Remote businesses are flourishing. There are, they are building, hauling fuel and supplies all due to the snow track program. During the last eight years, the snow track program has seen a decline in funding for several reasons mainly the lack of enforcement of registration. So people are not re-registering their snow machines, partly because they don't understand the benefits and partly because they don't trust the governor will keep the program alive. Since the Walker administration, snow machine clubs, businesses and nonprofits have had to fight for the registration fees to be reinstated to the snow track program through receipt authority and not to be included into the general fund. Due to registration fees being only $5 a year and the lack of enforcement on the trail, the snow track program is quickly becoming a program of the past. Our funding has dropped from $250,000 per year to $138,000 this year. This year alone, we lost $13,000 from last year. Over the past eight years, snow machine clubs, businesses, and nonprofits have strived for an increase in registration fees. Increasing the fees from $5 to $10 a year would bring an additional $138,000 into the program for a total of $266,000 based on this year's fees. These registration fees have never been increased and have been $5 since 1997. Snowmobilers spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in our winter economy, which otherwise would be slow. Winter tourism is on the rise because of the groomed trails, which provide responsible riding, safety, and winter highways. 
on average, a single snowmobiler <clears throat> spends $50,000 in a season. A snow machine costs 12,000, a truck costs 30,000, a trailer that you pull your sled with costs 15,000. And then you would go out on a weekend and spend $100 for gas, $100 for food, and maybe $150 for lodging. A study done by Earth Economics in 2015 found that every $1 spent on a public open space in the Matsu borough, there was a $5.31 return on that investment. The groom trails have, have helped considerably in keeping the cost of the state of Alaska search and rescue to a minimal. With signs and maps and groom trails, riders are less likely to get lost. This means the troopers are called out less, so the cost to the state of Alaska is less. I've been involved in search and rescue since 1989. And since the groom trails have been introduced, Petersville Search and Rescue has had less rescues to respond to. <clears throat> the groom trails are critical to first responders. They allowed expedient access to the backcountry, thus helping the victims sooner and less likely to suffer loss of limb or life and allows ease of transportation, transporting victims with broken limbs. The snow track program benefits all Alaskans and anyone who wants to enjoy all that Alaska has to offer in the winter. The snow track saves lives, promotes safety, stimulates the economy and creates jobs. If the snow track program does not continue, it will devastate businesses, clubs and outdoor activities in all of South Central Alaska. <clears throat> So with that said, I would like to say thank you to Matsu Trails and Parks Foundation. Without foundations like these, our community would not have the equipment that we need to uh, provide groom trails. Um, Wes Hoskins, you rock. Thank you to Alaska Community Foundation and Rasmussen Foundation who also helped us with our new snowcat. And thank you to Lee, um, <laughs> you're great. <laughs> I'm done. All right. Yeah, we've been working on this snow um, track uh, conundrum for a little bit here, and um, and uh, and I hope that maybe this year we can make some progress on that. Um, so thank you, Michelle. Um, you are um, just so impressive. Again, another person uh, kind of off the couch that that turns into just like Nick turns into this amazing advocate for. Uh, the winter sports that you believe in. Um, we're gonna move now into um, a conversation about these sort of broader ways we might invest in uh, overall in the state. And uh, one of the best examples of that um, is about to, um, we're gonna talk about here uh, with uh, the man I keep calling our headliner for this session. Um, but, uh, Former Tony Governor Knowles is uh, his name is literally and figuratively uh, synonymous with trails and bringing big dreams to life. Um, the Tony Knowles Coastal Trail is an Anchorage gem that attracts visitors and delights residents year round. Um, so I'll let uh, Tony and Chris Beck and Max uh, Romy. Uh, take over the presentation from here. Um, and uh, again, we will share, uh, we'll have an opportunity after uh, all of these to ask more questions, probe more deeply and kind of dive deeper into all of these issues. But right now I am just thrilled and honored uh, that Governor Knowles has chosen to join us for this conversation. So thank you, Tony, and I'll turn the stage over to you. Hey there, Lee, I'm gonna leap in and just do the tiny intro to our 15 minute session here. And if you'd be so kind as to let me share my screen, I'll set that up. Yeah, you can. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Oops, one too far. So um, real quick, um, wanted to, um, you've just done the great job of introducing Tony uh, so thank you for that, Lee, and thank you, Tony, for being here. Thank you, Lee, for setting up this whole uh, event. It's, as always, super valuable, and it's been a fast five years since uh, that first one 
way back there in time. Uh, so I'm gonna um, just do these couple of slides to sort of hit, say hello and then pass it to uh, Tony. Um, this, for anyone who's listened to me talk or the Trails Initiative team talk for the last couple of years is the place we always start. And I think it echoes everything we've been hearing for the last couple of days, which as the words say, we've got these amazing resources. We've not really been smart about taking advantage of them to the degree that we might. So with that, and this image, which I'm sharing just to uh, give people a, a sense of the the route that Tony is about to talk about, but the notion is this 500 mile trail, much of which already exists or is in the planning stages, uh, connecting Seward and uh, Fairbanks. And I'm gonna stop share and let Tony take over. You have to unmute yourself, Tony. Thank you. Th thank you to Lee Hart and good morning to all the attendees of Confluence 2020. As we all know, the, the COVID-19 virus continuing to reach new peak levels has profoundly injured and threatened Alaskans health and devastated our economy. While taking the necessary steps to control the virus, we must begin to develop creative ways to expand sustainable commerce, clean sustainable commerce that will grow immediate and long-term Alaska jobs and Alaska-owned businesses. The answer to that challenge is literally right in front of our face, exploring and experiencing the Alaska outdoors. And that is exactly what the Alaska Outdoor Alliance has pioneered for the last four years and what Alaska Trails has championed for 17 years. What I wanna talk about today is one transformative project that would meet the challenge at a whole new level of physical and mental health, family bonding, Alaska jobs and Alaska owned businesses. It is the Alaska Long Trail. The idea of a long trail is not new. Alaska legislator Jonathan Christ Tompkins, along with your own Lee Hart, had a brilliant idea that a Trans-Alaska Trail from Prudhoe Bay to Valdez along the Alaska Pipeline route could be Alaska's Long Trail. Unfortunately, state and oil company bureaucracies have put a hold on most of that project, but that is still a work in progress. The plan that Alaska Trails has adopted is a 500 mile long trail connecting Fairbanks and Seward as the Alaska Long Trail. Ultimately, this could become a 2000 plus mile trail extending north from Fairbanks to the Brooks Range and the North Slope and south to a future Southeast Long Trail, offering an alluring mix of trails and ferry rides. Long trails such as the Iditarod and Klondike tell the story of Alaska and who we are. With the Alaska Long Trail, they can be also a part of framing our future and what we can be. Over the last two years, Alaska Trails has worked on the Alaska Long Trail, and there's lots of good news. First, the Fairbanks to Seward route and connections for corresponding service needs are almost all on public lands. This enormously reduces the complexity and cost of the trail. Second, many sections of this trail already exist. Third, there are shovel-ready needed parts of the project that can put Alaskans to work right now. Fourth, there are numerous funds available for the project, beginning with the newly passed Great American Outdoors Act, which will put at least three to $4 million available annually 
in the Land and Water Conservation Fund for Alaska. Matching money for this fund can be from state, local, private foundation, and personal donations. And that will double the amount of total, total funding. Make no mistake, the Alaska Outdoor Alliance with its broad statewide economic base and network would be an absolutely critical ally and partner in this effort. We need community councils and local outdoor recreation businesses and user groups to urge local governments, state legislators, the governor or congressional delegation to provide funding and direct agencies to work on this project. The payoff for developing the Alaska Long Trail is big. First, there are the jobs building the bridges, new trail sections, trailheads, sanitation facilities, and trail access points. Second, the independent traveler that will be attracted nationally and internationally are the most highly sought after visitors because of the local economic benefits they bring. In addition, individual segments of what will become an internationally known trail will attract day use by all categories of travelers, helping grow that one more day of spending in Alaska. And of course, the biggest and best payoff is to us Alaskans for our own physical and mental health. We get to use this new adventure whenever we want, whether it's a brief day hike with kids or multi-day travel to directly experience new parts of Alaska in ways not previously possible. Will Alaskans use and will international and national travelers come to experience the Alaska Long Trail? Well, pre-pandemic, pre we had 2 million visitors a year. We also know that Alaska has an abundance of stunning natural scenery, unbelievable wildlands and waters with unequaled wildlife viewing on land and ocean as a total package that is unmatched anywhere else in the world. Millions of travelers have gone to trek on international long trails, the, the Coast to Coast Trail in England, the Inca Trail in Peru, the Camino de Santiago in Spain, and of course the Appalachian Trail, the Continental Divide, and the Pacific Crest Trails. For all those trails, that has been their moment. Now, the Alaska Long Trail can make it be ours. Thank you. Chris? Thanks, Tony. You're uh, showing very capably why uh, you, you remain a person, became governor and remain a person worthy of our attention and respect. So I have to say thank you very much for bringing your energy and ideas to all this. And in a different role, but equally appreciated is what Max uh, Romy has done and sort of put all those great words into 90 seconds. So I'm gonna pull up the screen that will allow us, <clears throat> excuse me, to uh, take advantage of that. And as always a test of one's, one's skills with the machine. So Max, why don't you, while this is pumping up, or actually, let's just let you go ahead and show this, and then you can tell how it came to pass. And I'm going to go to full screen. Are people seeing this? Yes. Yes, we're seeing it, Chris. Yeah. I don't think I don't think it's playing. It's not playing.
Well, not sure if that was showing up, but I can I can explain too, and then uh, and then we'll be able to share a link over as well. Would that work? D did that not come through? No, but we got a good song. Uh, <laughs> huh. Well, that's discouraging. Sorry. No worries. It, it says it was sharing, and uh, yeah. Why don't uh, we'll I'll, I just will send the link right now. And um, we'll ask everyone to do the obvious thing and to check it out. And uh, why don't you explain a little bit about what you've done? Absolutely. Yeah, so my name is Max Romy. I'm an international filmmaker, but this year I'm in Alaska, obviously. And the, the, the goal is to basically test out this long trail that you've been talking about. So ultimately we'll try to end up in Fairbanks, Nome, but so far we've done the Southern track this, this uh, summer, uh, seeing what it's like trying to be on an incompleted trail. And if you can imagine the coastal trail broken up into 10 pieces, it wouldn't be nearly as popular and accessible as it is. That's kind of what the long trail is in the Southern Trek right now. Seward to Anchorage has incredible trails, but they're all pieced out. And so we tried to connect those pieces, had a pretty wild time but uh, I'll be making a short film about all of that once I end up uh, doing some of the northern parts this winter. And it really gives you a sense of the, the challenges that exist right now, but also the easy fixes, such as a few bridges or um, just a couple sections that need to be completed. And you have a long trail that is uh, as good, if not better, than a lot of the long trails in the lower 48. And as an international filmmaker for several brands, I've been able to experience a lot of those. And I can say from experience, um, Alaska's got something unique and it is, it is just, just miles of trails away from being uh, viable. Thanks, Max. And I apologize to you and to everyone for it not showing up. I've done Zoom versions of that a number of times, but there we are. So yeah. I'm gonna hit a couple more slides and, and wrap up. So maybe just adding some specifics to the point you and Tony both made through this work that Alaska Trails has done, our statewide investment strategy. All of this is online. We have, um, with partners, identified a bunch of great projects, and I'm gonna show three in less than 45 seconds in total, which is, um, these are all the ones that are just excerpts from this trails investment strategy document. And we are using this information as we speak to talk with uh, US Forest Service about the Great American Outdoors Act funding. Um, this is up in the Matsu, shout out to Wes Hoskins and, and George Hooden and the crew up there for uh, helping pull together priorities in that part of the world. Um, here is a look at another example of an amazingly beautiful piece that would be part of the Long Trail. If you've not had the chance, Alaska's most accessible, best seats in the house views of the Alaska Range out of the Kasugi Ken campground on the Curry and Kasugi Ridge Trails. Um, and then one that I'm particularly excited about is the um, connections on the Tanana State Forest where the State Division of Forestry is now thinking more broadly about how you take advantage of the fact that timber harvest is maybe a 20, 30 year rotation. In between those times of harvest, and this is shown to be successful all over the world, you can be using those areas for all kinds of recreation. So those are just three of the segments that have already been identified. Some exist, some identified priorities. So what we wanted to do with this 15 minute session was to describe what you've just heard Tony and Max describe, but also use that as a reference point for the policy deep dive that will follow here, I guess in 15 minutes. And I know that the rule on PowerPoints is the more words you put on them, the better. I think I have that right. Um, maybe that was reversed. These are the things we wanna talk about. We wanna talk about, I'm just gonna to stick to the two headlines. As Tony said, there are many options for outdoor recreation funding. Money flows to good projects. This is a good project, but this is Alaska and we kind of are spiraling into this poverty mentality and a term that uh, Lee Hart's partner in starting the Outdoor Alliance has coined is this getting to an investment mentality. And uh, Aaron pointed that out and that's stayed with me. And then there's this term, the Alaska disconnect. We need to find ways so that we link growth and demand for services to growth and funding. And 
The details of how to do that are what we can talk about when we get into our deep dive, but there are local options, state options, federal options. A big theme is this one right in the middle of unclogging the uh, clogged federal outdoor recreation funding pipelines where millions of dollars are on our doorstep and we're choosing for reasons that really don't hold up to scrutiny to not take those dollars. So I'll uh, save the discussion for the um, deep dive session. The big overarching approach of this Alaska Trails initiative is make the case for economic other benefits, build a big coalition. With that coalition, identify really good projects like the Long Trail and through that, build the political support in the floor of funding, flow of funding to get those investments to, uh, to produce real results. So thanks for the time. Thanks for setting this up, Lee. Max, sorry that the beautiful video didn't come through. I'll send the link to everybody so they can find it and view it on their own and share it with their friends and family. So. All right. Well, thank you, Chris. Yeah, I think um, Max did do a lovely job on that video. Miriam has put the link up and, um, oops, am I unmuted? Yeah, I can. And, um, and so, but again, it's a good, um, you know, like you used the, the illustrative case that illustrates uh, the illustrative case for um, greater investment in outdoor recreation infrastructure. Um, you know, one of the things that we talk about at Alaska Outdoor Alliance, and I alluded to in our introduction, is, is that um, as we think about developing this sector and unleashing it and it, all of its power into um, our state economy, we want to be sure um, that we have an eye on um, just, equitable, and inclusive outdoors. Um, and in my next two speakers, I am thrilled um, to introduce an idea that is really groundbreaking, I think, but um, Angelica Rubio uh, represents Las Cruces in the New Mexico legislature. Um, and with conviction and determination, Representative Rubio um, shepherded to passage legislation that created the groundbreaking New Mexico Outdoor Equity Fund. Angelica is such a staunch believer in the power of ideas to transform lives, communities, and her state's future that she's taking time off the re-election campaign trail to join us this morning. And um, co-presenting with Angelica is our very own, um, Alaska's own fierce um, champion of equity in outdoors. I um, mean, an out, uh, avid outdoorist herself is Alaska representative and co-chair of the House Resources Committee, Committee um, Representative Garen Tarr. Um, so I will turn the floor over to Angelica and Garen uh, to talk about the Outdoor Equity Fund. Hello. And you may be on mute if you're trying to join in that conversation. Oops. Thank you. Yep, Thank here comes you. Angelica. You. She just got on. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And I'm looking to see Rep Rubio is here. Yep, she yeah. is Okay, she's a, she must be in the group I can't quite see. Oh, there we are. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. So the way we're gonna do this this morning is our guest, and we're so grateful to have her join us and take time of her, out of her schedule is gonna speak first. Then we're gonna talk about what that might look like for Alaska, and then we'll save um, the discussion portion for that, that next piece. So. Um, thank you. I am very excited to tell you about Representative Rubio. So I'm just pulling up um, her, oh my goodness. I'm embarrassed. I'm sorry. I pulled up the wrong, ah, I'm so embarrassed. I pulled up the wrong email that had her um, bio in it. Oh my goodness. One part, second, please. You're just doing this, Garen, so I feel better about uh, having not queued up the video, which I appreciate. I am so sorry. I am so embarrassed because I thought I had the it pulled up right here. And now um, I am so sorry that I am not finding it. Um, 
I don't know if Lee could help me out and resend it, but what I can tell you from what I know of working with Rep Rubio is um, we had met through the National Conference, or National Caucus of Environmental Legislators, because people there very much celebrate her work, and um, I, you know, she was the one that brought this um, an idea to us. This group has really been taking on the issues of outdoor recreation and how that influences public lands management. So she has been a leader in that group and sharing her work. She was a freshman when she got this passed. So that is a big accomplishment for any legislator and especially to take on an issue like equity. I can tell you from um, working here, that's never gonna be an easy path. You have to have people sort of conf and, um, and I know she's also an, uh, avid outdoors woman herself and is really into biking and has done um, some long trips, long trips to raise awareness about different issues. So she's the real deal. And I'm very excited that she could um, join us. And I hope you'll accept my most sincere apology that I did not have that in front, in front of me um, because she is such a dynamic and outstanding person and so lucky to have her join us. Thank you. No, absolutely. Thank you. And I don't know if, am I right on time then? So I can start? Yep, yep. you can okay. just go right into it. Um, great, no, well, so thank you everyone. Um, I am really honored um, to have been invited to participate in today's conversation. Um, again, my name is Angelica Rubio. Um, I serve in the New Mexico State uh, Legislature. I represent District 35 here in New Mexico, which encompasses the second largest city in New Mexico, and in my opinion, the best city, um, which is Las Cruces. I represent a very diverse community that not only neighbors the city of El Paso here in, in just south of us in Texas, but it also neighbors Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua um, in, in, the country, in Mexico. And so I am a fronteriza through and through, and that just means I'm, I'm from the border with generations of family living along the US-Mexico border, which is probably one of the most unique, diverse and familial regions in the world, um, despite what some might say. Um, as someone who was born and raised along the border, I also have a very deep connection and relationship to the land and its people. Um, it's a place where I have personally found peace and healing, especially on my bike, which has become an extension of my body over the course of the last few years. Um, with that said, in, 2020, in 2019, I co-sponsored legislation to create the New Mexico Outdoor Recreation Division a division under the New Mexico Economic Development Department. Um, but the most innovative piece about this legislation was the vision around Outdoor Equity Fund, which um, just last month announced the inaugural award um, recipients. And it is the first of the kind in, its in the country. Um, and it was created to allow youth equitable access to the outdoors. The grant will support transformative outdoor experiences that foster stewardship and respect for New Mexico's land and water um, and, and its cultural heritage. Um, I want to just emphasize the importance of this Outdoor Equity Fund and its connection to the New Mexico Outdoor Recreation Division because when the conversation first started here in the state of New Mexico, it was during a governor's race. And currently our, our governor is Michelle Lujan Grisham, um, but during the election, there was a lot of conversation around outdoor, uh, outdoor recreation and building that. And from my own experience, um, coming from an equity, um, looking at issues from an inter intersectional and equity point of view, um, this was what I felt an opportunity to really explore and unpack what outdoor recreation could look like for New Mexico. And this is where the vision for the outdoor equity came um, to be. And so I have been serving in the New Mexico legislature for four years. Um, I am, I, I, I'd like to say that I was a freshman um, when I introduced the legislation, when the legislation passed, but I was actually just beginning my, my third year in the legislature. So I wasn't um, the badass freshman uh, that Representative Tarr um, described earlier. In fact, it took me um, a couple years to even just get my feet wet to really um, fully understand the entire process. And I'm still learning um, that this entire process here in New Mexico um, but the Outdoor Equity Fund is one of my proudest achievements so far, and my hope is that it won't be the last. Um, but if you look at the stats and rankings, New Mexico's children don't get the best out there in comparison to those living in other parts of the country. In fact, our New Mexican children rank very low when it comes to access to quality education, access to quality health care, and overall quality of life. And so 
access to the outdoors is an absolutely incredible tool to ensure that all of these areas improve over time. And that was my commitment to the work. And that was um, what we have been really centered on over the course of the last year and a half. Um, here in New Mexico, the great outdoors is New Mexico's most treasured resource, like I'm sure it is for you all in Alaska. And whether it's our beautiful green forests, our clean air, the mountains and the mesas, uh, the rivers that make New Mexico the greatest place in the world. But not every child in New Mexico gets to experience these healing and peaceful spaces, which in many cases are just in our backyards. Um, the Outdoor Equity Fund ensures that not only do um, does not only do all, every single child deserve a chance to experience them, but they also provide pathways that are a big step toward building a robust outdoor recreation economy that we know we can create here, unlike what other states have attempted to do. Furthermore, I also believe in the stewardship of our public lands, and um, I truly believe that the Outdoor Equity Fund is that first step into ensuring that, um, that not only is this a robust outdoor recreation economy here in New Mexico, but that we are developing a new generation of stewards, um, especially as we work towards addressing um, issues around climate change. Um, as I mentioned last month, the Outdoor Equity Fund awarded a total of $261,863 toward getting approximately 2,700 kids from New Mexico outside over the next year. Um, we were able to leverage over $7 million of total programming funds uh, a total of 84 incredible applications were submitted for the inaugural Outdoor Equity Fund grant cycle. And these applications came from tribes, pueblos, municipalities, counties, and nonprofits who applied by developing so many creative ideas to introduce young New Mexicans to the state's lands and water, um, especially in the time of COVID and trying to figure out the best ways to do that um, over the course of the next year. Um, we had an incredible evaluation committee um, that was overseen by our director of outdoor rec, Axi Nava, who is incredible. Um, if, if you can get a, a, a director like her that values equity in your outdoor recreation um, division or departments, I mean, that is, that is ideal for something like this to work. Um, the evaluation committee dedicated hours and um, some of the groups that were awarded were um, one here locally in Las Cruces, they're called Families and Youth Incorporated, and they called their project the Outdoor Legacy Project. And what this project will provide are resources and support to educate youth on conservation, climate, and cultural connectedness to the outdoors. And it seeks to empower youth by providing in innovative, quality outdoor experiences that promote having a sense of ownership, relationship, and re responsibility with regards to our lands and natural resources. Um, another one that I was really excited about was Caruna Colectiva, which is which means work, learn, earn, which is a work, learn, earn environment for indigenous youth to enhance the autonomy, creative skills, health and success through holistic practices and traditional culture. Their program aims to connect indigenous youth back to the water by taking bike rides along the Bosque trails and learning about the vital necessity of natural environments that are rooted in cultural identities, especially here in, in New Mexico, where we're such a um, multicultural state. Um, and lastly, um, another um, award was to the New Mexico Dream Team. And this was to um, for outdoor undocu healing. Um, um, for those of you who don't know, I am also, an, an, uh, my, most of my work came, uh, I came to be um, through immigrant advocacy and my activism because my parents are both, um, um, uh, from Mexico. And so a lot of my work is related to immigration. And so this group specifically is related to addressing issues for uh, undocumented people. This is the out, Outdoor Undocu Healing Program, which empowers immigrant youth and other students of color to grapple with larger questions of place, identity, history, and belonging during a four weekend backpacking retreat in Northern New Mexico's um, Carson National Forest. And it'll support multi-generational undocumented LGBTQ um, and mixed status families with the focus on social justice and therapeutic discussion and also climate change and the ways that environmental crises um, often hit communities of color the hardest. Um, for this upcoming legislative uh, session in January, we're looking for creative ways to also increase funding for outdoor equity funds so that we can provide access to an overall vision of getting 30,000 kids um, in New Mexico outside. Um, and some of these ideas include tapping into a percentage of revenues coming from recreational marijuana sales um, that we hope will pass statewide during the upcoming session. Um, 
with that, that's sort of a, a, an overview of the program. Um, I'm happy to share more in terms of how it led up to that, some of the complicated and sometimes complex conversations that I had to have um, as it pertains to equity um, from even our own allies. It was talking about equity was harder to talk with um, progressives um, than it was for my Republican um, um, uh, allies in the legislature. And so I'm happy to share more and, 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 and hear and, and, and share in terms of what, um, what my experience and all of that can, can help you all um, there in, in Alaska. Yeah, um, Angel and Angelica, thank you for taking time from the campaign trail. Um, I would appreciate, I think it would be a nice springboard into the conversation that's about to follow. If you could share with us um, what some of the obstacles you faced in winning passage of that bill were and the strategies or the messaging that you used to overcome those. Yeah, I really appreciate that question because um, when, so it was, so this, um, to be honest and frank, this whole idea around outdoor equity fund um, took shape um, at a local bar with between myself and um, one of my good friends who is a huge outdoorsman. And um, we wrote all of these ideas on a napkin and we were just super, we've just been so passionate about how do we bring um, young people um, into this conversation, especially from an equitably an equity an equity lens, and um, and so before we even approached the sponsor um, who was um, leading the efforts to create the division of outdoor recreation, we reached out to a coalition of over three of thirty people of thirty organizations that included. Um, environmental and conservation groups, but also immigrant rights um, organizations, LGBTQ organizations. Um, and so this coalition of over 30 organizations signed on to a letter um, right around the time that the governor won her election and was moving towards a transition. Uh, she was starting to build her transition team that we reached out and we said, um, if you are going to champion the, the creation of the division of outdoor recreation, we will not support the, 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 the we will not support the creation of the division without um, including the outdoor equity fund. Um, needless to say, that was not um, something that the sponsor of the bill was in, was happy about, and so it required a lot of negotiating. Um, to not only get the legislation in the, the language because he wanted it completely separate, um, but to also get buy-in on the fact that um, it needed to be someone like myself and, um, and one of my um, colleagues representing Navajo Nation that it was incredible, it was necessary for it to be led by women of color. Um, and so, we, um, that was just instrumental in, in all of that. And so the negotiating began early on um, in the, in uh, shortly after November, the election, and then throughout the transition. Um, and even at the start of the legislative session, even through the first month of the session, which was a 60 day session, we still hadn't introduced the legislation um, because there was just so much going back and forth in terms of the details. And so finally, um, by I think the close to the 30, 30 day midpoint, um, we finally got the language finalized. Um, it was introduced. And then um, when it got to the Senate, the Senate is super conservative and, um, and not just in terms of politics, but just in terms of the way that the language was written. Um, there's all there's a lot of 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 senators who are just in, in my opinion super picky about um, some of the legis some of the way that the language was written. Um, folks didn't really appreciate that it was written in the language of like memorials. They didn't they didn't really appreciate the fact that we were trying to give um, space for Native and Indigenous people and how this was going to be um, centered on 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 a lot of of our past and 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 um and how our history really um is very complex here in the state of new mexico when we talk about issues related to colonization and 
displacement and then now wanting to build an outdoor equity con an outdoor economy on this land so we were trying to make that an important piece of the legislation but of course for folks that was um, an issue and so it took a while for it to make it through committee um, in conservation committee um, eventually it made it past senate finance which is probably the hardest committee to get it through because um we we really had to work that committee hard because uh very few pieces of legislation make it out of out of there and so we were really happy when it finally did and then um it made it out of the house floor uh, the senate floor um came to the house within 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 the last week of the legislative session fortunately i i have a really great relationship with the speaker of the house and so um he was able to um, really support the efforts and make sure that we had the votes in committee, that we had the votes on the House floor. Um, Republican support was was incredible in the sense that um, I think that they really appreciated what this, not, not necessarily talking about it from a race perspective, but just from a generational perspective and how are we supporting um, another generation of stewards of our land to really protect the land for future um, generations, I think was a huge um, success in terms of, of the, the way that we were able to, to work with folks on the other side of the aisle. And, um, and of course, just the idea of, of getting young people outside, I think was just an incredible opportunity, especially because we have such a rural and isolated, we're, we have, we are a rural and isolated state. And so that this wasn't just an urban idea that this was actually going to help support so many communities across the state. And so um, that made it out of the um, the house. Um, it went up to the governor, and and she signed it. And um, and and that's it. And here we are. Um, Garen, would you like to uh, share some of your thoughts when you think about um, the equity fund in Alaska and, and the conversations you've had with Angel Angelica about about how that might work here? Well, thank you. And first, again, please accept my apology for just, yeah, not not having the right email in front of me. So I want to read something first about her, because this is what I really thought was so cool about the bike rides. And I had read about this when I had your bio in front of me, but didn't get to say. So after her reelection in 2018, Angelica prepared for the 2019 legislative session by organizing a successful 300 plus mile bikepacking trip from Las Cruces to Santa Fe. The bikepacking trip was to raise awareness on the disconnect between the state capital and the rest of the state. She did this, so again, this past January, when she's not organizing and working on issues of justice, you can find her at home hanging with her dog, Lennon, or riding her bike along the dry ditch banks of the desert in Don Donana County and beyond. Um, but I just thought that was very inspirational that that you, um, you know, you really, you really did it. You, you know, you took that effort to raise the awareness about that. And um, in this group, I think um, something that we would want to celebrate, you know, that people um, taking that kind of uh, putting themselves out there in that kind of way. So thank you. And I, again, thank you for <laughs> understanding um, on that. So what I will say here is um, the connection and, and what I learned through the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators um, through the small work group, that's where I've been really um, understanding, learning about her work. And, you know, we have just, I feel very, um, like just tipped my, my kind of finger into this, very um, have scratched the surface in terms of learning. And, you know, this is a great um, time for me to learn more. What I feel like I've learned from her and what I talked to you, Lee, a little bit about is that I've learned enough to know that I need to learn more. And for example, I represent the lowest income urban district in the state. Equity is a huge issue. And, you know, we love Alaska for all this access to outdoor activities that very few of the kids that I represent um, get, get to do. That's just it. I know Beth Nordland from the Park Foundation is on, you know, thankfully there's programs that try to get some of our kids out. And so for me, the first step is, um, you know, getting a strong foundation to understand what's going on so that we can get to the place where we could say, you know, our goal is 30,000 kids. Um, you know, they've really been able to do that work to, to, to understand better the need. I think um, that's where we're at is we need to do that work. Um, you know, so we don't come in and think we have the answers without really having listened to the right communities of people to tell us, you know, more about what the problems are. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's probably the most critical piece um, for why we were so successful in um, passing this legislation, especially especially because of where we are now um, in, in not only with COVID and, and how COVID has unveiled all these inequities that many in our communities are experiencing, but the summer of reckoning that we've had with um, race in this country and that um, we were lucky enough to have had this conversation over the course of the last, um, the last two years um, when it comes to just access to the outdoors. And um, part of the reason why I think that, that our legislation was able to be so successful is because um, one, we had a really understanding administration that came in that was um, really interested in some really, um, um, not only just cutting edge policy, but also um, intentional in terms of around how are we going to address um, a number of policy issues that are intersectional because it's not just about uh, the siloed focus on outdoors or the siloed focus on health or the siloed focus on economic development, but it's really how we look at um, all of these issues in, in a way that they intersect so many of our, of our communities. And so um, I think that um, as an organizer myself, as a community organizer, one of the, the, the um, principles that I really try to um, look for in, in everything that I do legislatively is meeting people where they're at. And this was one of those places where um, this really led me to um, be centered on the, the lives of the people that it would be directly impacting, but also how do I bring not only my allies with me, but even perhaps people who didn't really understand what we were trying to do to not um, leave them behind either, but to bring them with us. Because while we may not agree philosophically on, um, let's say, addressing disparities in health or whatever, um, for many, economic development was a big deal. And so this was one way to, to center around that. Um, and I have a question too. Um, uh, are there, um, how, how politically active or, or like that, that connection you had with the Navajo, um, you went out and, and, and reached out to them or they heard it perkling out and came to you. How did you forge that relationship to get that tribe involved in advocating for this? Yeah, that's a really great question because um, the historically here in the state of New Mexico, what political, what politicians have done is they consult with native and indigenous people and then that's it. Like, I think for myself and um, my friend, um, councilman, he's a councilman actually, Gabe Vasquez here in Las Cruces, um, because of the work that we have been doing in social justice circles, even before we were elected officials, um, we already had established relationships with people all across the state through all of our work. And so when this opportunity came to be, um, it was just a matter of, of, of really forging those relationships and, um, and, and making sure that, um, that ideas that were coming, that were, that were starting to percolate were really um, centered um, in, in their experiences um, because again, like this issue around uh, creating an economy on outdoor recreation, when we are on the land of the people in which we're colonized in our state, um, it's a very complicated um, conversation to have. And so I think that is the reason why um, the Outdoor Equity Fund, not, not, not that it's, it solves everything, oh, hundreds and thousands of years of, 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 of um, injustices, but it at least brings us to a place where we can begin to sort of create a different way of how we, um, how we work with, um, with each other, because it's, 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 again, it's when you have a state government that was built on, um, 
a lot of these historical injustices and then still trying to forge relationships with tribal communities, um, there's, there's, there's a lot of, of, of effort needs to be made where it's not just about consulting, but it's also about it, that whole idea of not leaving people where, meeting people where they're at. Like, um, if the legislation is not ready for this year because you, those relationships haven't been forged, then it's worth it. And I think that was the challenges that we had to overcome especially with some of our progressive allies is that they wanted to win this issue so badly. But at the same time, we had to also say like pump the brakes because if the right people are not at the, at the, at the center of this work, if the right people are not at the table, then there's no point in passing this legislation. Great. Yeah, no, those are good insights. And I think valuable to any time we think about uh, passing, you know, working with our legislators to pass um, whatever our interests are uh, and whatever bills we're getting behind uh, that. And, and I really appreciate your com comment about, you know, uh, the intersectional uh, connections um, and not just, again, kind of siloing that. I think that's what we've been working toward. I hope that um, in this next legislative session that besides meeting with um, natural resources committee um, in Senate and House that we can meet with transportation and health and human services um, to talk about some other ways that we intersect um, uh, with, with their interests and, and, and can uh, help the state, you know, work cooperatively with the state. Um, so thank you uh, for that and thank you for your time. I, I hope you can stay. Um, we're gonna go ahead and, and segue into this deeper dive conversation. And, and Garen, I, I didn't tee this up for you, but if you're comfortable, um, you know, just any other thoughts you have for us, like if you think ahead to the, to the next fly-in, just generally um, how we interact in Juno, whether that's going to be in person or remotely on Zoom again, but um, just uh, you've 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 been kind enough to invite um, the conversation with our sector to the Natural Resources Committee, and um, that's just blossomed, and um, and so you've been there from the start for us, and uh, I just hope you can share some insights with us as we move into this deeper dive discussion about overall investing. Sure, and, and would you like me to say something now and then we're gonna transition yeah. into the other groups? Yeah. What I would say is, um, you know, we shouldn't stop telling the story about the economic data that's come out from the federal government. Now it's all in our mind because it's been out for a year or more now and, you know, we've been repeating it, but there's gonna be a whole new group of legislators that haven't heard that information. And even the ones that are coming back, some of it don't, you know, they don't have it planted in their mind in the same way that we do. So, you know, I think um, just remembering that we have that really strong, you know, data to help advance, advance the cause and um, just, you know, not sort of already moving on too quickly. I think um, and, uh, Representative Rubio had great questions or comments in, in terms of that, you know, we just get in this sort of pass pace, get it done, get it done, get it done. Hold on a second. You know, there's a really important story to tell here. And I think if we you know, lay the right foundation and tell the story and really, you know, people become the true believers that we need them to, all the work after that's going to be so much easier. And so, you know, just really still focusing on, you know, what we've learned, how it can be so good for our economic recovery, for the long term, for sustainable development, for, for people's health, you know, when we can start addressing equity. So we make sure, you know, all kids, all Alaskans have access um, to the kind of out, outdoors activities that we know keep people healthy. I'm certain that we could reduce our substance misuse and suicide rates if we were able to put some funds and in, into these other activities that can be so healing and spiritual and, and you know, um, help with, you know, recovery and, and all of that. So um, I just think, yeah, let's not move on from that. Let's, let's not think that everybody already knows that state story. Let's really focus on telling that story so that you know, every, every single person could tell it themselves. Every single legislator could tell it themselves. And um, 
since one of the things we're going to be talking about is funding, and and Helica, um, while we still have you, um, can you tell us about the success story of how the seed money that you were able to get passed in the legislature? What happened to that when it when industry and others found out about it, and how did that um, grow? So you can give our group some ideas about how that might work here as well. Yeah. So. I like to so I like to say that there was so much luck involved in this whole process because like you all I'm sure New Mexico is heavily reliant on oil and gas and so in 2019 we just had an obscene amount of revenues that were available to us and so the way that legislation um, or the way that the budget process works here in New Mexico is is that and sometimes in my opinion, it's not an equitable one is that um, we, we basically pay our bills um, and then each legislator is given a certain amount of money to go back to your district to pay for like brick and mortar projects. But then 2019 also gave us um, each legislator an additional amount of money um, to basically spend on two on four different things um, some that were recurring and some that were non-recurring. And so I made sure that the outdoor equity fund got a recurring amount for every year. And so, um, for, for that, it was the seed money was the hundred thousand dollars for, um, outdoor recreation or for outdoor equity. Um, and looking back, of course, now I'm like, why didn't I ask for more? And so this is where I always, um, this is where I've been telling legislators that, um, go for broke and then figure out like later on during the whole negotiating because um that was one of just me being such a young legislator that um, my friend Gabe and I were like why don't we ask for more but we now have a recurring hundred thousand dollars um and then of course the program the programming we were able to get for the division itself um um but what we are, um, what we were also able to do is because the, the, there's, we, we were, we were starting to build so many good relationships with, um, companies and private, um, industry or, uh, uh, folks, private industry folks around the outdoors, um, that, um, folks like REI, the North Face, um, the Turner Foundation, a lot of different, uh, the Wilderness Society, they all gave us, um, they all donated to this project, um, to this outdoor equity fund, which allowed us to have the $200,000 um, for this year to provide to, to the, to the um, organizations. Um, moving into the legislative session in January, and this is something that um, I briefly mentioned, is that we're trying to explore other opportunities. Um, we have yet to... Um, um, legalized recreational cannabis here in the state of New Mexico. And so that is one of the avenues that we're looking at is how could we tap into um, some of that. And then um, if we're able to, and, and we're not asking for a lot, um, but be based on what we think recreational cannabis can do for New Mexico, um, we think that we could we could find some sustainable amounts of, of funding to not only increase um, access for for um, for young New Mexicans, but also to for, to have this longevity around it. And we hope that also, if the outdoor community, especially with this reckoning that we've been talking about related to race um, this summer, if 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 industries are absolutely and I and I challenge the biking community all the time when it comes to this issue is is that if you're really serious about addressing race. And making sure that that your sport or your your outdoor activity is as inclusive as possible, then it's or it's programs like the Outdoor Equity Fund that you need to be investing in because this is where um, that that work can begin to to take shape in in many of our states. Um, I'm also encouraged by the fact that Senator Heinrich here in New Mexico is trying to push something nationally. Um, and so depending on the outcome of Tuesday's election, I know that Vice President Biden is interested in the idea of an outdoor equity fund um, at the federal level. And so um, this is something that um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing, um, regardless of what happens on Tuesday, that we can continue this conversation around what can happen at the federal level 
Um, and, and so there's some ideas out there um, being um, tossed around. Well, that's certainly encouraging. Um, thanks again. Um, hey, uh, I'd like to, um, again, kind of talk about this deep dive issue about investment. And, um, you know, on Monday during our public land managers forum, um, speaking of where do we get revenues to do some of this stuff, um, our state parks director mentioned an idea um, that he's floating about increasing um, vehicle registration um, about 10 to $20 um, that would have benefits in a number of areas, but um, it would allow us to, um, you know, right now the, the collection of parking fees at state parks and other fees um, from my experience in Valdez is largely sort of a voluntary exercise. It's, it's, it's hard to enforce. Um, so that, so by creating this registration fee, then all Alaskans would have free parking at state parks. It would replace that income. And then it would also um, provide enough money to meet that matching requirement for land and water conservation fund. And at the higher end of that increase could begin to be used to start chipping away at the $65 million deferred maintenance budget that our state parks has now you know, is Alaska, we're very tax averse here, um, but it is an existing tax. Anyway, that's one idea. Um, and Chris Beck, I'd, I'd like to um, um, have you have, turn over uh, the, this, or, or share this conversation, have you share the, uh, this discussion um, about these ideas on investment? You know, we've been working with Garen and other legislators to, to crack this nut especially when it comes to LWCF and, um, um, and again, talk about just an awareness building and an education effort about, yes, we have a problem and here's what it is. But, but Chris, do you wanna share some of the thoughts you had for this kind of deeper dive look at investment? And you're on mute. Yeah, be happy to, and I think that the, uh, the slide that I joked about that uh, had so much material on it, I won't keep it up indefinitely, but I think it might be a useful reference for um, thinking about this topic. So I'd ask people's forgiveness for putting that many words on a slide and I'll try to keep my fingers off it, but I think it's maybe a helpful overview and. I'll do that briefly and then kind of open it up to people's thoughts. Um, the, uh, Lee has capably described the reality that Alaska has many opportunities to get federal funds, but they do require substantial um, contribution on the state side. And so um, I'll, I'm talking in the state, the middle category there is we need to work with the legislature. As Garen says, we need to make every legislator aware of the benefits, the reasons for these investments and use that to unclog the federal outdoor recreation pipelines. And um, that requires a administrative position. Um, Lee made reference to the loss of $1.2 million in 2018 land water conservation funds for lack of a $75,000 allocation in the state's capital budget. And we're getting ready to do that same thing with 2019, 2020, and then the soon to grow 2021 dollars. So we need these administrative funds. We need to find ways to keep the cost of administration down. There's a lot of innovative ways to do that. that um, a couple of the members of the legislature, JKT is one, Tom Begich is another. We're working with the congressional delegation. And Garen, we should get you involved and lay out kind of a path forward on finding practical ways to cover the administrative costs and then the matching funds. And a key point on the matching funds is that those um, typically have been half covered by the state and then half gone out to local governments and tribal governments. Those monies are gonna to grow to $3.5 million starting this coming fiscal year. So even if the state can't find I'll try to think of a nice way to say it, make the wise decision to come up with its share of the match. We want to make sure that the local governments who are more able to at least have the chance to do that. So that's 
a bit on the state side, um, I've added that line about monetizing recreation use, like HUT user fees, generating more money from the activities that happen. And you can't talk about any of this without the reality of just Alaska needs to solve its fiscal challenges. You can't do that without some broad-based taxes. And even though none of us, because we're Alaskans, want to pay for anything, um, many of the issues we're wrestling with go to that a fundamental issue. So that's some state stuff. The locals are in the position to get those funds like land and water conservation, but they require a match. And um, so that's a category to continue to pursue. On the federal side, bottom of the page there, there are um, opportunities to make it, to lower the bar for getting those dollars. And that's something that the, our legislative delegation has tried to accomplish. It didn't happen in the first round of the Great American Outdoors Act, but um, they're pushing for that. A 50% match is hard to reach in Alaska right now. And so there's a suggestion on trying to reduce that for a while uh, to allow some of the money that comes for those to be used for administration. Um, as Lee said earlier, the middle bullet under federal, we've got this, um, Land and Water Conservation, Great American Outdoors Act, and then this upcoming reauthorization of the Surface Transportation Act, um, and then annual agency appropriations. We don't have earmarks like the good old days, but the um, reality is there's still a fair amount of flexibility when a concerted and organized voice goes from Alaska to our congressional delegation, who in turn can relay that on to the Department of Interior divisions and um, departments. So I think there's a bunch of words for you, but it all goes to this notion of we got to get organized as a group to amplify our power. <laughs> we have to have a consistent and strong message. And we in some ways have to be a rare thing in Alaska, which is a group that rises up. I didn't mean this to be a speech, but it's turned into one that rises up and says, we need to be responsible adults and start paying for stuff. And cover some costs and provide our match. And like uh, we heard like with the track program, people need to register their snow machines and then the money needs to go to maintain trails. So there's no doubt the benefits are there. So anyway, that was more than I intended, but there's a reference for some things to talk about. Yeah, I think that um, when I think about it, I come I, I, uh, in kind of broad strokes and I'm really, this is the time when we're, we'd really welcome uh, you can uh, raise your hand or uh, unmute yourself if you'd like to add to this conversation. But the kind of the way that it feels like it's mapping out for me is, is we start with education. We're gonna have a whole bunch of new legislators. Um, we need to keep reinforcing this message about um, what the, we are as an economic sector with great, politic, with great um, economic potential. Um, we will have on, um, I'm going to plug it right now, but it is important. We have the new economic numbers coming out of the federal government. And on November 11th um, at noon, you can tune in to a Lunch and Learn broadcast with a, a, an analyst from Washington, D.C. from the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis who will share those new numbers because that's the new numbers we need to begin, you know, putting into our dialogue with all of our leaders at the state and local level. To, and so the new numbers will be both federal and Alaska-based economic impact numbers. And so that I've asked the analysts to really drill down and help us understand those Alaskan numbers. So that's the education piece. Then, um, you know, what Chris was talking about, in my mind, kind of distills down to the fact that um, what we've uncovered is that there are some state inflicted problems, this indirect cost match for administrative fees that Chris is talking about. Um, we're looking, we've been having conversations with the Office of Management and Budget. I don't wanna to get too geeky here, but we're having these deep conversations to find out where the blockages are really happening, what type of change needs to happen. And that, will help us hopefully begin to resolve the federal, the federal matching um, fund side of this equation. Then in my mind, when we get to the state level, we have no fewer than six direct agencies 
um, that manage state public lands. And then you put throw in the Department of Transportation, Health and Human Services, and various federal funds that come into those departments that are aimed at programs that you know interface with outdoor recreation. It feels to me like we need to have at least a short-term uh, task force with the heads of all of these agencies and representatives from our sector to find out ways in which we can better be more efficient in how we're spending the money we do have, right? Are there, the questions would be, are there redundancies in administrative costs that if we reduce those across these various agencies, would that mean we could move more money out into the field? Or we can go back to giving money to Department of Transportation to plow turning and pass. You know, if we begin, if we, and I don't know, but we need a group that can study that and we need all of the agencies at the table. Now, another important thing that's coming down the pipeline that we need to all flag and be aware of is that in order to receive at least land and water conservation funds, we have to have an active statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan. Our plan in Alaska expires at the end of next year. Without a new plan, we don't get any money. So next year, a focus is going to be, uh, we need to come together and have input and make sure, and National Park Service has already agreed that they will help us um, bring that plan back together. And I think National Park Service and, and, and state parks are talking about how to do that and fund that. But this is our time to take a look at these kinds of issues and get it in a statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan so that it's on paper, it endures various changes of you know, political leaders and whatnot. And we have a roadmap to the future. So I'd like to hear um, from anybody else on the, uh, on the call about your feedback and response and thoughts um, as we think about how we, you know, we've got a lot on our plate and, and sort of who's on first, what's on second um, in your minds. Um, anybody that wants to pop in can unmute and, and join the conversation. Um, I've got a, a question kind of from, from the bottom perspective, I guess, but um, like, I'm not a state Senator. All I can do is like encourage people to vote. Um, and I'm also like, you know, I'm 26. And so I'm kind of from that younger uh, generation that appreciates the trails and has a lot to gain and lose here in Alaska. And I'm just wondering what I can do as just like a civilian to help with these kind of huge, giant, you know, multi-million dollar issues. Like what, what can I do as like a, a small person? <laughs> well, I'd like to say that um, Max, I think you, you are doing things um, in your, you're contributing in ways that are logical to your skills and your profession. Um, you are a multimedia storyteller and you getting out the beautiful artwork we have been putting together to encourage people to vote is one example. The 90 second video you know, you've done for the Alaska Trails, we will use these assets with your permission to continue to try to reach um, people, you know, younger folks in the state and encourage, their, um, encourage them to express their voices and, and support what we're trying to do. Um, the lunch and learns that we're having, some of the goals of that is again, to bring new audiences into our fold and expose them in ways that are relevant to them, to what we're doing and what we're about so that when we do have a bigger ask later, they'll at least, you know, maybe, maybe it will mean more to them. Gotcha. Karen, do you have any thoughts? I would like to add 
just increase communication with your legislator. Now, I happen to be his legislator, so we're getting a lot of communication <laughs> right now. But um, <laughs> for others, because honestly, I think there's this idea that the, a lot of that happens, you know, just out of the what are people 35 on here, if during the first week of session, okay, every person on here sent an email to every legislator and said, you know, hi, my name is Max, you know, I live in Anchorage. And, you know, when you're looking at the budget this year, I just want you to know a big part of why I live in Alaska, you know, what makes this an attractive place for me to live and contribute to the economy and want to be a part of this is the access to public land. You know, I hunt, fish, ski, flight sea, what, you know, whatever is your passion, um, you know, share that story, why it's important, you know, getting more of those business owners. You know, that's an important part of our economic recovery is making sure that a lot of these small business owners that are involved in, you know, sort of the big, big topic um, kind of tourism um, industry, you know, that those folks are going to survive because, you know, unlike the international companies, right, these are people who live, work, you know, spend money in Alaska. And when their business is closed, our communities are hurt, you know, and they may leave Alaska. So um, just, you know, really engaging with people that this is a key issue. If everybody wrote a letter to the editor, you know, that's never happened in the 20 some years that I've been working in Alaska politics. I've never seen something like that ever around these, these issues. So I think it could be very impactful. You know, you can't kind of overtake it. Um, you know, there'd be some moderation, right? The, the newspaper's not going to print 20 letters every week about adventure recreation. But, you know, if people at a steady pace kind of, you know, made sure that was a part of the narrative and conversation throughout the entire legislative session, because, and Lee, I hope can, you know, talk about this now that she spent more time in Juneau, the squeaky wheel. In Juneau, there are probably a dozen oil lobbyists just hanging, lurking, waiting, hanging, lurking, waiting. Boom, a bill comes up. They're in your office, one an appointment, 10 minutes later. You know, we just don't have that kind of presence. And, and so many other industries and opportunities, are, it's the same sort of difficult scenario. But I tell you, from my perspective, you know, that is a big part why our economy is like on this very, you know, slippery slope of decline, because we didn't develop other industries, you know, because the strong voices in Juno, you know, that had a lot of money that were always there and had a presence were just this one industry. And, you know, every, everything else kind of got lost, it lost in the conversation. As the co-chair of House Resources, when I do presentations, I'll tell people, you know, if someone talked about Department of Natural Resources for a minute, 50 seconds would be oil and gas, you know, five seconds would be mining, a couple seconds would be timber. And then it, you're lucky at the last second or two, if people talk about Division of Parks and Recreation or Division of Agriculture. And those are two areas that we just have tremendous opportunity. We're land rich, consistent with the Alaska lifestyle. You know, people like we want to live here. We want to be our own boss. We don't, you know, we don't work work to live, we live to work, or not live to work, we work to live, you know, we want to get out and do things, we don't, you know, we're not kind of like under the same, like, you know, I want to work 60 hours a week, because I'm keeping up with the Joneses, I'm like, I'm working 60 hours a week, because next month, I'm going on a backcountry ski trip, <laughs> you know, so um, I just, yeah, a lot more engagement, telling that story of just how important it is to the people who live here, and the business owners, and you know, what kind of impacts that has on our community, what kind of volunteer things people do, you know, not only are you, you know, contributing in your professional way, but, you know, if you're also, oh, I'm a volunteer with this and that. So people really understand um, the connection. I think, I think that could be helpful. And that day, the, the economic data, you know, it's just a, a, a huge part of that. Um, we just, we're not the squeaky wheel right now. I would like to uh, mention that you know, after being involved with efforts related to outdoor recreation for more years than I like to confess to. Hey, Lynn, can I can I can I stop you just a second, Lynn? Yeah. Can you can you talk about um, give give people where you're from and what you do? Uh, okay, I'm Lynn Brandon, and and I'm the executive director of Sitka Trail Works, and of course Sitka. So uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk about this topic. And, but I really uh, think that this rising tide is rising on the sea of change slowly. And, you know, just in the last several years after being involved in recreation for all of these years, you know, I see that there is incremental change occurring. And I think that people are starting to get their heads wrapped around this, you know, much, um, 
in part due to um, the ATI effort and, um, you know, where we finally got some good numbers and, you know, people are looking at those numbers. And so I really think that the way that I've had to do things for many years, it just takes a lot of years to make those inroads. But I do see that it's starting and, you know, it's Lee and Chris and everybody like that, that's really doing some excellent messaging. And I just think we need to, you know, keep it in people's faces and then also try to affect that change in our local communities by, you know, making sure the assemblies know, you know, the importance and, you know, and then the more people we get involved that are the decision makers, the more apt that, that this change is going to, you know, we'll re have the recreation revolution is what I talk about it because, you know, I've been in <laughs> the guy getting cut, you know, for all of the years, the first to go. So, you know, I'm very passionate about, you know, how much recreation brings to people's lives and, you know, things like when we talk about equity, you know, I helped get a playground built, a community playground in a skate park. And a lot of the motivation behind that was because it's a free thing for kids to do and that gets them outside active and playing. And, you know, it's, it's even, you know, those sorts of projects, I think that are kind of the grassroots of getting kids out. That was just my equity sidebar, so thanks. Yeah, hey, um, I see Nick has a hand up. Nick Delizio, um, or, uh, would you like to share your thoughts? Yeah, I, um, so I'm a lot newer to the whole advocacy world and, you know, I just feel that it's, uh, I'm finding that it, it's directly affecting me in a negative way. Some, some, you know, things that happen in policy. So that's why I've sort of stepped into this world a little bit more recently in the last couple of years. But I guess what I'm, I'm finding is it's hard to, you know, these people that, a lot of these people that make these policy changes and whatnot, um, are, are a lot of them are all about, you know, the oil and the money and the whatever. And they see people like myself and probably a lot of people on this um, conference here as these, you know, hippie greenies, tree huggers. And we immediately get discredited. Like they don't even listen to us. And so I, I guess the biggest challenge overall in this whole nation is trying to figure out how can we present you know, our message that um, speaks to them. And I think especially with like public land, I mean, a lot of these, you know, I'll just say Trump supporters and, and what have you, like there, a lot of them are very into hunting and fishing and everything. And it's all on public land and snow machining and ATVing and all that kind of stuff. And like when someone like myself is advocating for public land, it's, it's very much for those people specifically. And so I just, I don't know, that's just some thoughts that I've noticed is a lot of these organizations speak very well to people like myself, but they don't speak very well to the other side. And again, it's like, we're, we're doing this stuff very much to help them. So I don't know, just my thoughts. Yeah, uh, go ahead, Max. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say, um, on the back of that comment, which I really appreciate, and then hearing what, what Garen was saying about kind of being the squeaky wheel, it almost seems like sometimes we're the dog whistle. Like, I feel like there's this, these organizations, I mean, maybe on the hippie greeny side, make a ton of noise, but it's like, it's like not being heard or it's, it's in the wrong direction. Um, and I've been really lucky to work with um, GoPro and Patagonia. And actually I, I made two paintings. They're both gonna be released election day, encouraging people to get out and vote. We made a video for GoPro all in Alaska, all outdoors, and it reached like 400,000 people, I think. But like, I feel like that's just out into the world. And it's like, if it targeted Alaska, I mean, that's Anchorage. Like, that's everybody in Anchorage. And so it kind of feels like with, with Patagonia, with GoPro, with these companies, like they'll say like, oh, Anwar, like, oh, public lands, but they're saying it to people in Seattle and they're not saying it to Alaskans. And so I've got a foot in their world and I would love to be able to get a foot in the, I guess, like the Alaska world, because if they just are able to redirect it to Alaskans, Alaskans are the ones who actually make these decisions. And even just 
in a couple of these meetings and hearing what people are saying, I mean, this has inspired me to the action I've taken, but like, what if the fire hose of these larger brands was actually able to do something in Alaska instead of just spraying it over the rest of the US? I feel like it could be a massive uh, connection and change. And, and like you said, um, Nick, like, yeah, how, how can we speak to all Alaskans as well? Because there's so much more that is the same in that Venn diagram than is different between the, you know, hippie liberal greenie and the, the gun-toting Trump supporter. Like, they're 95% the same and when it comes to outdoor recreation. It's like the great connector. How do we, how do we make that something that we can all agree on? Yeah, yeah, and I'll just add real quick, like, Patagonia is a great example of what I'm talking about. Uh, it's been amazing what they've been doing with all the documentaries and advertisements and, and what you're talking about, Max, you know? And so the problem is, is people see the Patagonia logo and immediately discredit it. Right. And so I feel like if Patagonia would do the exact same thing, and I don't mean everyone, like I very much appreciate it, but the people on the other side discredit it immediately. And so I bet you if like Patagonia just released everything underneath a different logo, I have a feeling like it would, it would make the difference. So. Well, um, Max, I'm Beth Nordland and I run the Anchorage Park Foundation. I'm definitely going to be in contact with you. Um, we work to get kids outside, um, urban kids outside on the trails. And we work to hire um, kids in the summer for youth employment and parks. Some of the things I've found with the national funders like Patagonia is that they're interested in um, heavy adventure outdoor recreation promotion, which is great. But in some of this equity stuff, we need to be talking about just urban parks. <laughs> and so I haven't found, like we haven't been able to apply for a uh, a Patagonia grant, really. Um, we've gotten some jackets for some kids, <laughs> but um, we we haven't been able to make some of that messaging fit for, because Anchorage is urban. It's an urban city and we've got all the urban problems that, <laughs> that other people have, um, you know, including obesity and suicide and domestic violence. So it's, um, yeah, I'm really interested in, in working with you. Yeah. I, I, this conversation is, it's really exciting, but it's also kind of maddening um, <laughs> because I, 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 there's a lot of barriers um, with our own politics in the state. I mean, I, Garen is right. We got to just keep pushing on it, um, keep working together, keep um, increasing our new voices. Um, but I, I think in the equity conversation, which is so critical, um, the, the, the part that has been frustrating to me, even during the Obama administration, was they just kept talking about, you know, getting people outdoors, urban kids, and then the money was all for, you know, the backlog of national parks, which our urban kids are not getting to. What one big thing that I know with especially filmmaking and Garen mentioned that, and I'm so glad that you're mentioning this too. Um, there's this expression the 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 what is it the the extraordinary ordinary. And it's this idea that it's like, you don't have to climb Denali to have an outdoor experience. In fact, when you hear somebody talk about climbing Denali, we can't relate to that. I've never done it. But what I can relate to is when they talk about like how much they love, you know, eating food when they get back or how good it was to get into a tent afterwards. We can connect on these small things that we all know, but not necessarily the big things. And when it comes to the outdoors, talking about urban parks or something, you can't discount a kid's experience like, you know, the first time a kid sees a moose on a green belt or something that is incredible and there is all that wonder and they don't need to be in some you know wild huge giant space in the middle of nowhere i mean the outdoors are literally everywhere outdoors like you can you can have that experience anywhere and so um yeah just from a storytelling standpoint like what garen was saying if we all reached out to 
legislators and stuff, like if we can just share those extraordinary, ordinary stories, like that's what's gonna get people. So yeah, let's definitely connect. And this is, this is really cool. The, um, for just for a little bit of context, uh, Mark uh, Barica had to um, hop off to another meeting, but what we were talking about before we started this morning, um, he and I, just this growth of um, our industry, the outdoor recreation industry, is still relatively new. You know, our our data from the feds is only a few years old where healthcare or automotive or whatever is just decades old. So we're, we're, we're still young and we're still getting our act together. And I mean, not our act together, but um, we're still growing our power. And I think that when you talk about um, people seeing, you know, you mentioned outdoor recreation and people throw you into the greenie bucket. Well, that's because who that that's who they've been hearing from, right? They've been hearing from the conservation sector. Um, and so when we have like when we have these conversations now, um, I try to be very disciplined about keeping it onto the economic message or this opportunity message. And so it's very clear that, oh, you're not just, because believe me, I mean, Garen knows this, like our first time in Juneau three years ago, that was the first reaction. Like, well, how do you feel about, you know, um, one of our legislators offices asked us about a particular conservation issue. And I'm like, well, that's not what we're here to talk about. Like we have our feelings, but this is our focus. And so conservation underpins, you know, our efforts. But there's a lot of groups out there, conservation groups who are really well versed, have banks of lawyers and everything else and, and that are doing that work. We have our own job talking about um, the outdoor recreation economy and close to home recreation, like, you know, in the parks and recs in our neighborhood and and connecting to our wild places. But it's it isn't, you know, we've only been at this for five years now and, and we're you know, that's why I say we're, we're growing um, knowledge and awareness and um, um, we have ways to go, but I appreciate these comments so much and just um, welcome. And I, I, I'll take the floor away. I just wanted to provide a little bit of what I think is that context and also to assure you that there are about um, 20 of us, uh, 20 other colleagues of mine in other states that are, we're all working together to talk to, to get our industry to have the brands like Patagonia and REI, well, REI is already there in the North Face and others to recognize, uh, to, to, to maybe think about diverting some of their um, <laughs> philanthropy toward these efforts because on the ground and close to home is where we can have very big difference, you know, in, um, and so we're, we're, our, the statewide group of people like myself are working to try to push the industry to give more recognition and resource support to these efforts and make grants like, you know, the grant you can't get your hands on from Patagonia more available. So we, I, I might add sort of on this spirit, I, the recent experience of a proposed new trail now under construction on the hillside called the Hemlock Burn Trail reveals part of the reason the outdoor recreation industry and outdoor recreation users have less impact, I think, on the, the goals we're reaching because we are often divided among ourselves in, uh, in ways that are really counterproductive. So a lot of time and energy over the last couple of months has gone into kind of an intertribal battle between one group of trail users who love understandably the quiet, peaceful social trails they've enjoyed on the hillside. And then uh, another group, particularly the mountain bikers who said, we don't wanna be using up the existing trails. Let's build a new trail and put some bikes on that. And, and I think in many ways, it was an illustration of a misguided argument. Instead of those folks fighting one another, um, I think it would be great, and this I think goes to kind of all of us who are tend to be more cross-country skiers, uh, tend to be more backcountry hikers, to 
to accept the reality that in Alaska, we need to be supportive of everything Michelle is saying about snow machining and supporting Nick and what you're doing and looking on both sides of Turnigan Pass. It's the snow machine crew, it's the backcountry skiers. And if we can bring the full array of outdoor recreation users, Max, you said this too. So it's the hunting and the fishing and the consumptive users as well as the non-consumptive wildlife viewing. That voice is incredibly powerful and it tends to almost negate one another. I know with the work we're starting to do on the long trail, we're gonna quickly get into issues of who's gonna to get to use that trail? Is it gonna be backpacking exclusively? How about bikes? How about e-bikes? How about snow machines? Um, so I think that being open, I think the degree of power we have in Alaska is reflective of the degree to which we have or don't have a coalition of all the outdoor recreation users in the state. And, and that's gonna be like talking to myself about, yeah, I wish it wasn't so busy in this place. It used to be really sweet and quiet, but having more people on board, pushing all the things we're talking about because we're welcoming the broader tent is one part of the progress we need to make because I find much of the friction that I encounter, <clears throat> we encounter through the Alaska tra Trails effort is with um, our fellow backpackers and skiers who don't want to see change. And I think the solution is more and better trails for all of us. Let's not discount the need for stewardship. Let's not discount the need for quiet places. But I think we need to be open and accommodating to let's have some big, busy places and, and hit that middle of the recreation market that actually likes busy places. So I like this discussion and I think if at the heart of it is how we have political power <laughs> and having everybody on the team is the way to get there. I Are would there any voices that would like to, or Karen, go, go ahead um, and, and we'll, we'll start to wrap this up. So if you have some comments, um, go ahead and raise your hand or just chime in after Garen um, finishes her comments here. Well, and I was just gonna say, I think for this um, group, it would be good to have a conversation around the revenue pieces, because I, I noticed Lukey said that, um, you know, they're looking at a work order on that uh, vehicle registration fee. You know, Lee shared that with me recently. I feel like I'm still processing that as to, you know, whether like I wanna fully get behind that proposal. I, I need to just understand it a little bit more and kind of in the overall long-term funding picture, what it means, because, if that fee is just going to supplant other state funds, in the end, we're not getting ahead any, you know, we're changing a fund source and, and we're staying still underfunded. So for me, I, you know, that's why it's a, a big, important conversation of like sort of where do you intend those go? What's, what's the vision with that? And I have been also exploring the idea of uh, making the Alaska Highway a toll road because you come through like the whole Tetlin Wildlife Refuge is through there. there um, the, a lot of the facilities are really underdeveloped. There are no public facilities, really restrooms of any kind. You know, so that's an idea um, that I have, you know, would take that stretch from coming in. We have like no welcome facilities and I'm from the Midwest. People wait their whole life to come to Alaska for one trip. And, you know, if they come overland, you come into Alaska and, and it's really, it's really bad. There's no welcome facility. There's no welcome center. There's nowhere to even stop and get gas or coffee or go to the bathroom, basically until you get to Toke. And there's a welcome center in Toke. And I just, I'm not sure that's like what people are expecting in, in terms of like you coming to Alaska. So, you know, I would love to see some infrastructure along that area um, and, you know, really like capture people when they come into the state and help them plan their whole trip. Like, where, where are you going? Where are you spending money? Like, look at all these opportunities. So, you know, those are just some of the other, like, that's just an idea because of me driving back and forth to Juneau. And I did a lot of documentation. Our facilities are in such bad shape right now. We have places where it's supposed to be a scenic view that clearly no one has done any tree removal in five, seven years based on the size of the cottonwoods in there. There's no scenic view. There's a parking lot. There's no scenic view. There are other places where there's actually supposed to be an interpretive sign Apparently no one ever finished the sign. There's a metal post with no signage and some shrubbery now has grown around it. And it's like, are, really, we can't do better than that? I, I just, I don't believe that. I think, I think we can do better than that. So, you know, I think I'm very interested in kind of like thinking there's that 65 million in deferred maintenance. How do we, you know, look at this big picture, comprehensive um, need for funding, you know, long-term sustainable, 
both on the capital side, both on the operational side, um, investment side. And so I, I think, you know, if this group could set up another kind of work session to look through some of that revenue, you know, I'd be curious if that registration fee is something that really clicks with a lot of people and they say, hey, that's the right thing, you know, but I would love to have um, more of an opportunity to talk about options and get some feedback of, of what you think, you know, the, how Alaskans would react to those different op options. Well, and I'd, 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 thank you, Garen. I think that um, the upside of the downside of the pandemic and tightening budgets and things, maybe, maybe there is more of an appetite for assembling a group with broad interests to think about funding and infrastructure and a more cohesive approach to our investment in outdoor recreation. And, um, you know, we're one group, but again, each of those agencies, Forestry, Mental Health Trust, University of Alaska, you know, Division of Mining, Land and Water, you know, all of those agencies, not to mention DOT, um, Public Health, uh, and probably our education, you know, I mean, getting, if we all sit there and think about that um, in a more less siloed way and more comprehensively. I think whatever solution we come out with hopefully would be stronger. So I'd really um, love to have that sort of short term six month task force that really looks at that in a really meaningful way that has the support of either the legislature or the governor's office or some sort of body that gives it the kind of um, credibility it needs to advance those ideas. Other thoughts out there? Well, um, so anyway, uh, we've been on for quite some time now this morning. And uh, I will, I know we all have busy lives and other things to do, but I do appreciate everyone's time and interest and thoughts, your presence in all of the sessions and especially today. Um, we will continue this work. You will continue to hear from us. We will, um, my plan is to continue to have uh, Wednesday lunch and learns right up to the start of and through the legislative session. Um, they'll morph from, uh, they'll, they'll morph into these different harder hitting topics. And hopefully we can get our new legislators and even some who've been around campus for a while uh, to tune into some of those and, and, and at least, or their staff and get some sound bites and some better understanding of what we're doing even before uh, we get to whatever shape the this year's fly-in will take. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, conclude this session, conclude Confluence. Uh, thank you again all so much and please, um, sign up to get the newsletter and, and whatnot, but we, we, this is not the end of it. We're just continuing to build. Um, and thanks to my partners, the presenters this morning, Nick and Michelle, Chris, Governor Knowles, Max, and, um, and Garen and Angelic, Angelica Rubio, uh, really uh, infusing that equity thing into this conversation is so important. Thank you, Lee. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Lee. All right. Thanks, Lee, and I'll just say Rep Rubio had to jump off, but she really appreciated um, being on and she stands ready to assist in any way she can. Yeah, great, thank you. <laughs>